The first thing that we saw when we looked at section 11, now the general deduction formula was that it told you that you have to be carrying on a trade. So let's look at what that means. So the definition of trade can be found in section 1. It says trade includes every profession, trade, business, employment, to see that, calling, occupation or venture, including the letting of any property and the use of or the grant of permission to use any patent. Right, so letting of property and granting the use to use patents or designs or trademarks. Right, so those are all carrying on of a trade. It's a very broad definition. So, pick and pay, is it carrying on a trade? Would you say? Yes, because it's a business. Uh, panel beater, so a place that fixes cars, so carrying on a business, yes, it's a trade or a profession. What about you, if you are working and earning a salary, are you carrying on a trade? Yes, employment. Okay, now that's very important for you to see up to that point. It means so far, even if you are earning a salary, you are carrying on a trade. That is correct. Okay, so now, what does it mean to be carrying on a trade? So I just want you to, just as a quick little background, it's not something you see too often, too much detail. But carrying on a trade means, how do we know if it's carrying on a trade? So it's not a, first of all, the Burgess cause, court case told us that it should be given a wide interpretation and it is not necessarily exhaustive. So what they're saying is that this over here should be given a wide um, interpretation and it's not even complete yet because anything else can be a trade. So what do they say? They say, usually we look at the continuity of activities. How often do you do things? If you do it on a quite often basis, we'll probably consider that a trade. There's usually also a long-term objective to generate a profit. So those things are usually indications, if you see it, that you think that is a trade. But now, interesting enough, the courts have also said, however, even though that's the case, please note that continuity of activities and long-term objectives to generate a profit will not necessarily mean that's the only thing that's a trade. So it is possible to do something only once and for it to be carried, continue, carried on a trade, considered to be carrying on a trade, and to do things only once and not even to generate a profit, and it can be considered the carrying on of a trade. Okay, so again, it's very quite broad. Usually, it's very, very clear they are doing something. But, what do we know about it? What is more important here? Carrying on of a trade means that you're doing something. Even if you do it once, you don't have to repeat it. But, what is not a trade? One of the things that they've said is passive income. Passive income is not considered the carrying on of a trade. What is passive income? Now, sometimes I've heard this term being thrown around a lot. They say, for example, if you invest in a property and you put a tenant in it, that's passive income. That's not passive income. Passive income is literally where you put money somewhere and you don't do anything again and you just get money in return. So, for example, if you put money in the bank and you earn interest, you don't have to do anything. If you buy shares and you earn dividends, you don't have to do anything. If you've put money into an annuity or a pension, so all of the years of your life you've worked, and now you're just sitting at home and you're getting a pension. You don't have to do anything now to earn it. Those are all passive incomes. If you let out a flat or a property to someone, you have to deal with administration. You have to pay things. You have to collect money from the person. You have to see if there's problems. You are active. It might not be the hardest of work, you might think, but it's doesn't mean it's passive. Passive means you don't do anything. So th what does this mean? It means if I now go and I put my money into the bank account. Okay, so I want to, I've got, um, I almost made a dollar. We've got a thousand rands. I want to put it into the bank and I want to earn interest. Okay, the interest I'm going to earn per year, let's say it's 10%. It's a high amount, but just bear with me. It's 100 rands. Now to do that, the bank charges me five rands. Can I claim that as a deduction? That's basically what, why we're looking at this. The answer will be no, because are you carrying on a trade, which is the first requirement? No, I'm not. This is passive income. So you can't, earn, you can't claim it as a deduction. Okay, but there's one exception to this rule. And this is quite interesting. People always say SARS always wins, and SARS will always nail you and all those things. But there is a situation, this is what I just described for you, where I say you put money, you invest money. So I will say, right, let's say, here is bank A, here is Mr. X, 
and here is let's call it investment A. Mr. X goes to bank A and borrows 10,000 rands. So that means bank A gives Mr. X 10,000 rands. The interest, let's say, is 8%. So 800 rands for the year. Mr. X takes that 10,000 rands and he invests in investment A. And here he earns interest of 10%. Right, so let's say 1,000 rands. So, so usually this would be passive income. So would you be able to claim that 800 rands? So this is money that you remember. You, you took money from bank A. You have to pay them 800 rands. So this is an expense. Right, that's an expense. And this is income in my example here. Can you claim that 800 rands is an expense? Usually you would say this is passive income, so you can't. But here is where SARS has been nice. SARS has allowed people to claim that 800 rands if they are earning interest elsewhere. So they would then say, you would say interest earned is 1,000 rands, and then you would list 800 rands expense you would be able to claim as a deduction. I'm not taking into account any interest exemptions in my example here, just very simple. You would be able to claim as a deduction. This is not something that the Act says, but which SARS has allowed. So they've issued what they call practice, a practice note. A practice note is basically a document from, that explains what SARS does in practice. It is our practice to do this. Where SARS has explained this. And I would recommend that you read through that if you don't understand this concept here. All that is important here is that you cannot create a loss. So what does that mean? It means that, let's say here when I borrowed it from bank A, instead of paying 800 rands interest, let's say the interest expense is at 12%. So it is 1,200. And I only still earn 1,000 rands. So then this expense over here, can you see if I say minus 1,200, I will then have a 200 rands loss. SARS will not allow this. They say, we are nice to allow you to claim any deduction. If you, we don't have to. But we're not going to allow you to claim a loss. So what they said is you can then claim a maximum amount of basically a thousand like that. The difference they will allow you to carry forward. So, the general deduction formula, again, tells us and this is something that you need to know off by heart, basically. It says, when carrying on a trade, expenditure and losses actually incurred during the year of assessment in the production of income, not of capital nature, to the extent it relates to trade. Now, you'll see this little block here where I say during the year of assessment. This is not stated in the Act, but they accept the courts and general practices have accepted that as being part of the formula. So although the Act doesn't say it, you need to basically state that that is the case. So let's talk about these individual elements. We've already spoken about what it means to be carrying on a trade. Now let's talk about expenditure and losses. Now this is very simple. Basically, all that this means is you can claim a deduction for expenditure and you can claim a deduction for a loss. Now there's been some court cases where they've discussed this. The Joffe case, the Joffe and Co case, is basically the one where the court said we don't really see that there's a difference that was intended between expenditure and losses. We actually see that the, all that the Act tries to tell us is that you must include both. They said, if we have to make a distinction, it may be that a loss is involuntary and that an expense is not. So basically all that they told you is that you can claim it for expenditure and losses. Then, actually incurred. What does it mean for something to be actually incurred? Now, under the gross income definition, we saw something can be accrued to you. This is basically the other side of it, actually incurred. So this means if you've incurred an expense. Okay, now, before we talk about all of that, let's start from the top here. Actually incurred. I want you to see, it, the word used in the Act says actually incurred. It does not say necessarily incurred. Now, why is that important to understand? It means that if you have two people over here, 
right, person A and person B. Let's say they are both florists, so people that sell flowers. Person A buys for invoices white paper that costs one rand per sheet. Person B says, no, I like my invoices to be pink with flowers on it, so pretty papers, and that costs five rands per sheet. Now, why is it important to understand that something is actually incurred and doesn't, doesn't say necessarily incurred? Because person A takes plain white paper and pays one rand a sheet. And let's say that's the cheapest paper you can get. Person B goes and has an extravagant expense and taste and pays five rand a sheet. Person A and person B are both entitled to claim the amount that they've spent. You cannot say that it wasn't necessary for, poor, for person A to spend it, therefore they can't claim a deduction. It only matters, did they actually spend that amount? Yes, then they can claim a deduction for it. Right, now, please also note that the word is incurred and not paid. That doesn't mean it, it doesn't apply to amounts that have been paid. It means that it implies the amount, amounts which have been paid, plus amounts which have not yet been paid, but which have been incurred. Now, what does it mean if you incurred something again, guys? It means if you've got a creditor. So I go to the shop, I buy something on credit, and I say, I'll pay you in six months' time. Today, when I bought it, I've actually incurred it. Okay, now there's a couple of court cases again. The Echo Stores case told us that an amount will only be actually incurred if there's an unconditional legal obligation. So what does this mean? It means that you must have no alternative but to pay the amount. So if I go to the shop and I buy something today and I walk away, even though I'm only going to be paying them in the future, I have already taken the stock and the goods, which means I've incurred an unconditional legal obligation. So therefore, it's actually incurred. Right, so it is possible that there are amounts which you've not yet incurred. So let's say X Limited, just as an example, X Limited makes a deal with the government, okay, with ESCOM, that says, let's say it costs X Limited usually a million rands per year in electricity. ESCOM tells them that if they put in all sorts of new machinery or new sorts of energy saving equipment and stuff, the government will give them a discounted amount. But they'll only determine this a couple of months after year end. Let's just say that. So you've incurred an expense, but how much have you incurred? That's basically now the question there. Now, have you got an unconditional legal liability? Yes, you do have because you've used electricity. You may not know what the amount is, but you have incurred an unconditional legal obligation for it. Okay, so I'm just using it as an example to show you that it's not the amount that determines it. It's whether or not you've incurred the expense, and by using electricity, you have incurred the expense. Right, there's no deduction for contingent liabilities. So, let's use this as another example. I have a motor dealer, and I say to people, I, um, I'm selling, when you buy a car, there is a, a warranty that I will repair for free anything that goes wrong in six months time. So within a period of six months. So I say I will incur anything. Now, I might make estimates of what I think that is going to be. And when you study things like financial accounting, it might be a provision. But from a tax perspective, until a person drives their car in there and says there's something wrong, I do not have an unconditional legal obligation. So I cannot make a provision for it until it has been incurred. So it's not a contingent liability. I can't claim for it. So again, I must have no choice but to pay it. 
De nationale persbeperk case, it basically speaks around the same thing, but it says if a payment is conditional on some event happening, it is only actually incurred when that event has happened. Okay, so let me give you another example quickly of that. Right, January to December. This is a company, X Limited. X Limited says, and X Limited says to Mr. A, you will be paid a bonus on 31 December of a 13th check. But only if you are employed on 31 December. If you leave before then, then no amount is paid. Okay, so. Let's say the 13th check amount is 12,000 rands. So every month you know you basically make a provision for one twelfth of that amount. If this employee, Mr. A, is there on the 31st of December, the moment on the 31st of December he's still employed, you be it becomes obligated for you to pay it. But not until any day before that, because it's a condition of his employment. If he leaves on the 30th of November, he gets how much? Nothing. Does he get 12,000 times 11 over 12, 11,000? No, because I tell you, if you leave before the 31st of December, then no amount is paid. However, if they said, if you leave before 31 December, the bonus is prorated, so prorated, then that 11,000 rands, if it is on the 30th of November, because remember January to November is 11 months, that 11,000 will be allowed as a deduction. Why? Because every single month that the person is employed, the bonus will be prorated. So he is entitled, you've got a legal obligation to pay that person. So therefore the amount is then incurred. Then we have the Golden Dumps case. The Golden Dumps case basically says, if the outcome of a dispute is undetermined at year end, then the expenditure has not been unconditionally actually incurred. Basically what this means is, let's say that you are a company X Limited, your customer is suing you. Right, you've got a December year end. So they took you to court in August and at the end of the year the court says we will only decide whether or not you are guilty of this in March next year. So our tax year ends in December. As of the 31st of December we will only have to pay this amount if the courts find us guilty. At the 31st of December what do we know? We know that the courts have said they'll only decide in March. So can we say that we know for a fact we're guilty or not? No. So the 31st of December, the Golden Dumps case says it's not basically unconditionally incurred, so therefore we don't claim a deduction for it. Right, guys, just over here, you might have this situation as well. It might be possible that you've incurred an amount, but you don't know what, what the cost is yet. If that is the case, then you must make an estimate, right, and submit an estimate for it. Not something that I expect you to really see in an exam situation. Let me just quickly use as an example, January to December. Let's say I've got a business with trucks, and I was involved in a, my truck was involved in a bad accident on the 20th of December. And there's some damages that I will have to pay other people. However, the courts have already closed and the assessors have already closed. 
and I'll only make the decision in February of the next year, or in January of the next year, let's say. Now, I don't know what the amount's going to be, but what do I know? I know for a fact I've already incurred the amount because the accident happened before the end of my tax year. So, for the year end of 31 December, have I actually incurred an amount? Yes. How much? Don't know. But you'll have to make an estimate. Right, then, the Labatt case. Interesting case, an important case also. What happens if I have a company, so I've got a company, and then I want to go and buy something from someone. So ABC Limited buys a machine from Mr. X and pays with shares. Let's actually say ABC Limited buys stock, trading stock. I'm actually just going to do that for now. Okay, so ABC paid for the stock by issuing shares. Can we then claim a deduction under the general deduction formula for it? Has that amount been actually incurred? Remember, that's what we're looking at. The Labatt case said if you issue shares, you're not making a payment. You're giving away some of your equity, and that's not the same as an expense. So therefore, there is no amount that's been incurred and it cannot be a deduction. So that's very important, guys. You cannot claim a deduction under the general deduction formula by paying for something with your shares. Now there are sections, section 24BA and section 40CA, that's actually why I changed my example here, which deals with if you buy assets and pay for it for sh with shares, but we're not going to discuss that right now. That's a completely separate discussion. So again, if I pay for something with shares, I cannot claim a deduction under the general deduction formula. Right, then our next element is during the year of assessment, and like I mentioned to you guys, this does not form part of Section 11A in the Act, but it has been established with case law. All this means is you must claim the expenses in the year when they are incurred, I can't incur something in 2019 and then decide to only claim it in 2020. It will not be allowed. You must claim it in the year when it was actually incurred.